Ever since the final experiment, Eric Debay has been churning out videos left, right and centre. It's almost as if the whole thing has threatened Eric a bit, so he's doubling down with the nonsense. And today Debay is going to tell us that he thinks gravity is a psyop. Dear oh dear. Hello all and welcome along to another video with me, Simon Dan. Thanks very much for joining me. Right, on with today's video then, which as I said in the intro, comes from Eric DeBay. His channel is in damage limitation mode right now since the final experiment, which of course gives us some juicy new content to look at. Let's get on with it, shall we? The so-called law of gravity is a monumental hoax and constitutes one of the biggest psyops in all of history. Assuming we actually live on the spinning globe Earth promoted by modern Freemasonic science, consider the following calculations and contradictions. The supposed law of gravity claims its mysterious action-at-a-distance force can be measured as g times m1 times m2 over r squared, with g being equivalent to 6.674 times 10 to the power of minus 11. This is where Eric thinks you're going to hear the equation and go, wow, that sounds complicated, so it must be made up. The reality though, that equation, Newton's universal law of gravitation, has been tested to absurd precision. Cavendish measured it in the 18th century with a torsion balance in a shed, and NASA measure it daily when plotting spacecraft trajectories that actually work. Now, consider the One World Trade Center in New York, which has a mass of approximately one trillion 50 million kilograms. This means that if you are an 80 kilogram man standing 10 meters away from the One World Trade Center, then there should be an expected horizontal gravity of 0.05606 meters per second squared. And this is why you should never trust flat earthers when it comes to science. Because yes, Eric, you did work out the maths correctly, but when you work out the force of gravity with this equation, your units are in newtons, because you've worked out a force, not an acceleration. So the force of gravity between an 80 kilogram man and the One World Trade Center is around 0.056 newtons. The gravitational acceleration felt by the mass of that building uses a different equation, and that works out to be 0.0007 meters per second squared. In other words, Earth is pulling you down 14,000 times harder than the building is pulling you sideways. Not a great start there, Eric. Considering the standard rate of vertical gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared, this means the expected horizontal gravity from the One World Trade Center should be pulling at about 1 174th that of standard vertical gravity except for the fact you did it wrong, so it's not. I wonder if you see this video, you'll publish a retraction. This may not sound significant, but it must be measurable. And this point becomes extremely interesting when the same 80 kilogram man stands just one meter from the One World Trade Center. In this instance, the questionable law of gravity calculates that the horizontal gravity increases 100 fold to a whopping 5.606 meters per second squared, which is more than half of standard vertical gravity. Surely when you were doing this, Eric, you must have thought you were wrong here. It's clearly not that much acceleration, is it? That's the force in Newtons, remember? The gravitational acceleration is still only 0.7% that of Earth's. The building's pull does get stronger as you get closer, sure, but even hugging the wall, you're not gonna be dragged sideways. That's just nonsense. This would absolutely be both measurable and noticeable. The gravitational attraction between an 80 kilogram man standing one meter from the World Trade Center should be easily felt and should require significant effort to resist being pulled into the wall like a magnet. All of this arguing from Eric here is based off his faulty understanding of the universal gravitation equation. It's actually embarrassing for him that he's still going with this. Finally, if the same man were to be so unfortunate as to touch the Trade Center, the bogus law of gravity says that you will need to call the fire brigade to come and detach the man because he will no longer be able to break free by his own strength. Hilarious that he thinks he's got a point here. All for misunderstanding one equation. Consider the same 80 kilogram man now on a vacation to Switzerland where he goes to rock climb the famous north face of the Eiger Mountain. Here, the mystical law of gravity 
predicts that even if he loses his grip while climbing, there is no need to fear, because it's impossible for him to fall from the ten billion ton mountain. Since the distance between himself and the mountain is almost zero, making r squared in the equation nearly negligible, the amount of horizontal gravity pulling at him should cause him to cling to the rock face like a magnet sticking to a refrigerator door. What Eric does here is count the entire mountain as if all the mass was right next to you, which is obviously completely wrong. Real gravity doesn't work like a magnet stuck to a single point. You have to sum the gravitational pull of each part of the mountain's mass, and most of it's further away from you. The actual measured horizontal acceleration from a mountain is minuscule. In fact, this is exactly how scientists first measured the gravitational constant in the wild. The famous Shihalion experiment in Scotland. The mountain deflected a plumb line by a few arc seconds. Enough to measure carefully with instruments, but far too small to hold you against it. Thus, according to the magical law of gravity, we are assured that rock climbing massive mountains like these is actually among the safest of pursuits imaginable, because falling is deemed physically impossible. Again, it cannot be overstated. The formula for gravity implicitly implies that as any two objects approach each other, the closer the R value drops to zero, the stronger the pulling force that exists between them. When two objects physically touch each other, the gravitational force between them increases to a very large number, implying that they should become difficult to separate. Well, that's nice, Eric, but of course, real world R is never zero. In Newton's formula, R is the distance between the center of mass of two objects, not the gap between their surfaces. Even when you touch the surface of the Eiger, large parts of that mountain are either hundreds or thousands of meters away. Their contribution to the net force is so small that the infinite pull fantasy never materializes. This is just one more misunderstanding from Eric on the nature of gravity and the equation that governs it. In reality, however, only magnets behave this way, and no other objects show this supposed increased attraction proportional to distance as predicted by gravity. Freemasonic science apologists attempting to refute the necessity of non-vertical gravity will often assert the Star Trek argument of, gravity only comes from the center of the earth, captain. But this is a nonsensical double standard because the same broken law of gravity claims this calculable mutual attraction exists between all objects, even between two particles, and not solely from the center. That center of the Earth line is shorthand for the net gravitational force of the entire planet acting as though all its mass was concentrated in the center. That's Newton's shell theorem. For a perfect sphere, all the little pulls from all the bits of mass add up to exactly the same as if the whole thing was all in the center. That's a proven mathematical consequence of symmetry. Yes, every two objects do attract. You and the Eiger attract each other. You and your coffee cup attract each other. And technically, your coffee cup and your cat attract each other. But unless at least one of those objects is planet-sized, the forces are microscopic compared to Earth's gravity. Google AI clarifies, quote, Gravitational attraction emanates from the entire mass of an object, not just from its center of mass. When dealing with objects far apart, or those with spherical symmetry, assuming all mass concentrates at a single point is done to simplify calculations. Gravity acts on all parts. While the center of mass is helpful for simplified calculations, every part of an object contributes to its gravitational field, and this distributed attraction has significant consequences in various situations. That's right, and it's exactly why Eric's skyscraper and mountain argument collapses. Yes, every bit of mass in the mountain or building pulls on you, but most of that mass is far enough away that its contribution is tiny compared to Earth's. When an object is roughly spherical and you're outside of it, all those tiny contributions, remember, add up as if that mass is in the center. So ironically, the Google A answer that he's reading there actually proves the problems with his earlier claims. In other words, the pull of gravity comes from the entire mass of objects, not just from their center. So the excuse of claiming gravity only comes from the center of the Earth globe is an unevidenced, backpedaling double standard. Another one of gravity's nonsensical double standards is that this same force is attributed to two very different effects. Gravity is said to cause all objects, people, buildings, oceans, 
and the entire atmosphere to stay clinging, stuck to the spinning globe Earth. Meanwhile, gravity is also said to cause the moon to orbit around the Earth, the Earth and other planets to orbit around the sun, and the solar system to orbit around the galaxy. This means that sometimes gravity causes objects to stick to one another, and other times gravity causes objects to orbit around one another. This isn't a double standard, it's basic mechanics. The same gravitational force is at play in both cases. The difference, of course, is motion. If you're at rest relative to Earth's surface, like a building or a tree, gravity pulls you down and the ground pushes you back. You stay put because there's no sideways speed to carry you anywhere. But if you're moving sideways fast enough, gravity still pulls you in, yes. But your sideways motion means you keep missing the object that you're falling towards. That's called an orbit. Perpetual freefall combined with tangential tangential velocity. Newton nailed this with his cannonball thought experiment. Fire a cannonball faster and faster and eventually it will orbit the Earth. Same force, just different initial conditions. How can these two very different effects be attributed to the same force? Freemasonic science claims that if the initial speed and trajectory of the two objects is just right, then instead of crashing together, they can somehow perpetually orbit each other due to the force of gravity being perfectly balanced out by the object's inertia, causing a continuous curve around the central object. If this is true, why is there not a single experiment or demonstration in history that shows two objects meeting with such perfect inertia and trajectory as to lock themselves in perpetual orbit with one another? That is how orbits work. Gravity pulls in, motion curves round. And yes, we've got plenty of experiments and demonstrations. Every single satellite in Earth orbit is a working demonstration, from the ISS to the GPS network. Drop towers, parabolic flights, and space-based experiments routinely show small objects orbiting each other. Whilst you can't make a perfect perpetual orbit in Earth's gravity, you can absolutely demonstrate the principle. The limitations are environmental, not theoretical. Why is this special effect of gravity conveniently limited only to objects so large we cannot experiment on them? Yet another contradiction and double standard from the illogical law of gravity is the behavior of helium balloons. The formula for calculating the force of gravity depends solely on the masses of the two objects and the distance between them. This means any objects of non-zero mass will be subject to the pull of gravity proportional to their distance from one another. Why then do helium balloons defy this fickle law of gravity by first rising and then clinging to your ceiling for several days before slowly starting to hover lower and then after many more hours or days eventually settle to the ground? Helium balloons don't defy gravity. Gravity is still pulling the balloon down, just like it's pulling everything else down. What's happening though is buoyancy. The air around you is a fluid and the helium balloon is filled with gas. Now that gas, helium, is lighter than the air it displaces. The upward buoyant force is stronger than the downward gravitational force. So obviously the balloon rises. Once the helium slowly leaks out and the density changes, the buoyant force drops below the weight of the balloon. And of course, it sinks. That's exactly what the Archimedes principle predicts. It's why boats float, and icebergs rise in water, and why hot air balloons generate lift. Gravity didn't turn off, it was there the whole time, acting on both the balloon and the air. It's just that in the balloon's early life, the air pushes up harder than the gravity pulls down. Releasing the helium balloon from 10 meters off the ground, or one centimeter off the ground, makes absolutely no difference to the balloon's immediate defiance of gravity. Of course it doesn't, because gravity isn't what's making that balloon rise or fall at any given moment. It's the net force from two competing effects. If the buoyant force is greater than the balloon's weight, it goes up whether you release it from one centimetre or ten metres. The same applies for a basketball thrown into a lake. The broken law of gravity calculates that the basketball must sink and remain stuck at the bottom of the lake because the force of gravity depends solely on the masses of the two objects and the distance between them. But the basketball defies this law by immediately rising to the surface right after it's thrown in. 
No, gravity says the basketball was being pulled towards the Earth the whole time. And it is, but what changes that outcome is the buoyancy again. The basketball's full of air, which is far less dense than water. When you submerge it, the water pushes back. With a buoyant force equal to the weight of the water, the ball displaces. That buoyant force is greater than the weight of the ball itself. So the net force, of course, is upward. This is exactly Archimedes' principle again. Gravity is still acting on that ball. It's just being beaten by a stronger opposing force in this situation. You know what? I've had enough of this. Eric is not only misunderstanding the nature of gravity, but the equations of gravity too. I think we'll leave Eric for this one and wrap this video up. Let me know in the comments what you thought, as I say we're all done and dusted for another one. Thanks so much for watching today. If you enjoyed it, please do consider subscribing to the channel, hitting the thumbs up button too, and if the feeling really takes you, a share would be very appreciated too. I've been Simon and Dan. Have yourselves a great day and I'll see you tomorrow for debunking Mark Sargent's Flat Earth Clues Part 8. See you then.